what the score is when church is over. I am recording it, and I want to go home and watch it myself. And so please honor me and, and, and help me with that. All right, Acts chapter number 2, <laughs> please. Acts chapter number 2, and glad to be here tonight. All righty, look down at verse number 46. Acts chapter number 2. And uh, look down, if you would, please, at verse number 46. The Bible says, And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church uh, daily, such as should be saved. All right, we're continuing our Saturday evening series on church growth. Today is part number 18, and we're gonna talk about gladness among the people. Gladness among the people. It says there in verse number 46, and it says, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And the result, it says the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. And that's what I want the Lord to do here. And a, a part of the ingredients or formula, whatever you wanna call it, to be able to see that end result is if we have gladness among the people. All righty, please give me your undivided attention tonight, by the way, if you're uh, here, just sit up straight, pay attention, listen very, very well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for allowing us to be here tonight. Lord Jesus, please give me your power. Please give me the mind of Christ. Help me to say only that which you once said. And I pray for every person here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. Father, do a work in our midst that only you can do, Lord, and we'll give you all the glory for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. All right, let me give you some notes. If you like to take notes by way of introduction, the word gladness, here's basically what it means by definition. It means extreme joy rapturous delight, extreme joy, and rapturous delight. You say rapturous. Well, that's like the rapture. You know, when we get caught up to be with the Lord in the air, that's going to be someday soon. I wish it was tonight. Amen. But that's the rapture, right? And so God says, if you have gladness, you have a similar experience with delight, the feeling of delight, you're just caught up with it, and um, and then also it's extreme joy. Um, sometimes we think of gladness, you know, maybe you might think of it like, eh, like somehow, you know, some of you like laugh at my dad jokes, you know, you, you're just kind of, you, uh, that's not gladness at all, man. That's when you're, you know, hitting your knee and bellering and laughing and, you know, all that in your pew, that's, that's gladness, amen? And uh, I'll tell you a good dad joke tomorrow, come tomorrow, and I'll tell you, and I got a good one for you. But anyway, uh, gladness is extreme joy, rapturous delight. The opposite of gladness could be this, negativity. Are you listening? Critical, complaining spirit, a complaining spirit, a critical attitude or negativity. That is the opposite of gladness. Gladness will help produce uh, 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 increase in the church and the opposite of gladness will actually destroy a church, and God will remove his hand of blessing off of our church if we have the opposite of that. So gladness is so, so, so important. Every time you come to this church, uh, you ought to be glad the moment you walk in the door. Now, you could be in a battle out there. You could have difficulties out there. The devil could be uh, fighting you out there. Uh, you can have uh, trials and, uh, and, and testings out there. But man, the moment you walk in the door, man, if we want this church to grow, we have got to be a church full of glad people. And I don't mean manufactured gladness. I mean, listen, if you can't find a reason to be glad, you're not looking very hard. You're just not looking very hard. Brother Hiles, one of the greatest pastor I've ever known, Brother Hiles, and uh, he used to teach that whenever depression and negativity would come to him, and as far as his spirit, he'd be down in the dumps. He had one of those slats that he would pull out on his, on his um, executive desk, and he had taped on that slat above the first drawer just a list of 10 things that if he would just stop what he was doing 
and just think about those 10 things, it would instantly turn his spirit around. He would have gladness and joy in his heart, and that negative, depressed, discouraged spirit would just leave. And, and here's the thing. It's a choice. You've, you've got to choose it. Do you want to be depressed? Do you want to be angry? Do you want to be negative? If you don't want to be, don't be. But listen, there's a way that you can get yourself glad at any moment of any day. For example, man, how many of you are glad you're going to heaven, that you're saved? Amen. I don't care what you're going through in this life. This life is the only hell you're ever going to experience for all eternity. I mean, this is it. There's nothing else. And uh, heaven, you're heaven bound. Jesus is your savior. The rapture is your hope. Uh, the Holy Spirit's your comforter. The Bible is your love letter from God to you. And I'm just telling you something, heaven's real. And, and just that one thought, that one thought that you are saved and on your way to heaven, if you just stop and think about it for a while, it's going to put gladness in your heart. I feel sorry for Christians that are like, yeah, I know I'm going to heaven, but life is terrible right now. I'm just dead. Like, whatever, man. This life is but a vapor that appears for just little time vanishes the way and eternity's forever forever you're going to be in the bliss of heaven and paradise i mean that's worth getting excited about being glad about you know then the fact you can't lose your salvation you got a bible you got a church if your family's saved i mean praise god miss lavona made that comment today at the soul winning rally all of her children are saved are you saved bridget you sure? Okay. All right. All right. All of her children are saved. And, uh, and so, but that's a joyful thing that, that puts gladness in your heart. Scott passed away unexpectedly and shocked by it, but boy, we know he's in heaven and one day we'll get to be reunited with him and we'll never say goodbye, never have another death, never have another funeral. And this is, this life is only temporary, man. So much to be glad about. Okay. I'm going to give you four things tonight, four things, write this down. We got some sub points under a couple of them, but number one, look at Luke chapter number one let's get started and, and please just stay with me in your mind and don't be distracted don't talk people around you are distracted when you're talking and uh and don't be um, on the phone and just listen 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 and uh, god will bless your heart for being here all right luke chapter number one look at verse number 12 please luke chapter number one and look down at verse number 12 luke i am your father. Oh, I'm sorry. No, wait. Um, Luke chapter one. Oh, I didn't say it right, did I? Luke, I am your father. All right, here we go. Luke chapter one. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said that in church. Okay, here we go. Look at verse 12. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Jump down to verse 41. Verse 41 says, And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. That's John the Baptist. And about that, there's another proof text right there about the babies are babies in the womb. Amen. Um, a fetus or a clump of cells can't leap for joy and all that in the womb, but, but this is a human being in her womb. And it says, And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Number one. Write this down. Gladness comes when people are filled with the Holy Ghost. Gladness comes when people are filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay, now this is a real unique situation. This is nothing that I can tell has ever been repeated um, since this moment. But John the Baptist was actually filled with the Holy Ghost while in the womb of his mother. And what did he do while he was in the womb of his mother? When he heard about the salutation of Jesus, the Christ child uh, being conceived with Mary, uh, he leaped for joy in his mother's womb. And then in verse number 15 it goes on to say about john the baptist he shall be great in the sight of the lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink he shall be filled with the holy ghost even from his mother's womb and again he had joy because he was filled with the holy ghost listen 
You want joy? Get filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're negative, discouraged, angry, um, a, a contrary attitude, it's a sign you are not filled with the Holy Ghost. Because if you would be filled with the Holy Ghost, you will have joy and gladness. Okay, so there's two aspects of this, um, being filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, um, people who are, are glad, and gladness comes to those who are filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. I want to give you two subpoints under point number 1. Hebrews chapter number 1. <clears throat> and uh, let's see here. Hebrews chapter number 1. Did you all have some good coffee this morning? This afternoon, I had good coffee this morning and this afternoon. The rest of you, what's the matter with you? Obey the Bible. He brews. Get you a guy that brews some coffee for you and drink some coffee every day. Brother Lee, brew some coffee for your wife, would you? And uh, there we go. Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verses 8 and 9. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. But unto the Son... He saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Ready? Look what it says in verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, what is the oil of gladness? It literally is the Holy Spirit of God. That's what it is. God calls the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit of God the oil of gladness. And the Bible says that Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And that word fellows just means your companions. Who were the companions of Jesus Christ? Who were they? The, the apostles, the disciples, right? And he was anointed with the oil of gladness above them. Now, listen to this very carefully. God calls the Holy Spirit the oil of gladness. Just like the Bible says that when John, Baptist, John the Baptist baptized Jesus, when he came out of the water, a dove descended upon him. It was the Holy Ghost that descended upon him in the form of a dove. So like a dove is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, oil of gladness is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So when you get anointed or filled with the Holy Ghost, you are going to get glad. I mean, you just are. So letter A, write this down. Have a godly attitude. Have a godly attitude. Can I tell you something right now? Our God is a joyful and glad God. In, in Psalm 1611, you've heard me quote this and read this verse all throughout the 30 years I've been pastoring here. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. It says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. In the presence of God is fullness of joy. Listen, if you get in God's presence long enough, you're going to get fullness of joy. You're going to get that gladness. And, and then especially if you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you're going to start thinking my jokes are funny. You're going to laugh real good at my dad jokes, all right? But, uh, but that gladness, you're going to be glad. That's why people can go through trials and difficulties and hardships and still have a smile on their face, still have a positive outlook, still have upbeat, rapturous delight, even in the midst of storms. Why? Because they're filled with the Holy Ghost. They've been in the presence of the Lord. Next, letter B, uh, go to Isaiah 61. Again, we're talking about gladness comes when people are filled with the Holy Ghost. All right, so what is the deal uh, as far as what God wants us to do once we're filled with the Holy Ghost, okay? Isaiah chapter 61, this is a prophetic chapter, uh, passage about our Lord, and yet it also applies to us, okay? So the Lord gave us an example when he was on earth of Psalms, uh, uh, Isaiah 61, but this can apply to you if you'll let it. Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. Let's read it together. Look at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now, here's why. Because the Lord hath anointed me, again, it's the oil of gladness, he hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now look at this, verse three, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy 
for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be call, that called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Okay, if you get filled with the Holy Ghost, what's the purpose of it? Just so you can be glad? No, write this down, letter B. So you can spread gladness to others. So you can spread gladness to others. Listen, what do you spread to people? I went to visit someone today, and uh, um, um, uh, a gentleman that um, is a part of our church hasn't been able to come for a while, but uh, I walked in the door, and I said, where's your wife? And he said, she's in, in the bedroom. She's got walking pneumonia, and uh, she didn't want to get it on you. Well, when people are sick, what do you normally spread? You spread the illness, right? If you get around people that are sick, it's possible that that illness can come to you. But likewise, excuse me, you can spread gladness. If you get filled with the Holy Ghost of God, you're going to be anointed with the oil of gladness, and you are going to be glad, not just so that you can be glad, but so you can spread that gladness to others. You know, this world is hurting. If you would, if you could ever get out of just your world and, and what you go through and realize there are literally 8 billion people on this planet and most of them are really having a hard time. They just are. I was out, so, and by the way, soul winning will help you to open your eyes to that. I was out soul winning today and I met this gentleman and I got to lead him to Christ. And, and, and boy, as soon as he got done, he prayed the prayer. He lifted up his eyes and he said, man, I needed this today. He goes, God sent you to me because I've been having a tough time and I needed this today. I had no idea when I approached him. He didn't carry himself like he was struggling or having a bad day or having difficulties. No, but he was. He was. My preacher, Brother Hiles, back in Bible college times, he used to always say this. He, he would say this so often. He would say, be good to everybody because everybody's having a tough time. Everybody that you come across, they are having a tough time somehow, some way in their life. Who knows what it is unless they share it with you, but they are. And, and if you can spread that gladness to them, you just never know. God may help you to be able to reach them for Christ. You know, I decided I wanted to make efforts to just kind of be glad and, and to our neighbor. And I just wanted to just see what I could do to kind of help our relationship and not let it be so stressful and difficult. And so far, it's working out well. I mean, good night. He offered me two puppies. My wife was like, no, 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 no. We're not taking those puppies. You know, but I mean, that gladness, that fullness of the Holy Spirit, it could really help in situations where there's adversity or uh, difficulty or tension. And um, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, this world is hurting. And what they need is they need a whole bunch of oil of gladness. And if God would anoint you with that oil of gladness, if you'd get filled with the Holy Ghost, not only will you be glad, but then you can help spread it. So number one, gladness comes when people are filled with the Holy Ghost. Now we're talking about gladness among the people at Hopewell so that our church can grow, so that God would add to our church daily such as should be saved. Now, now listen, I want you to listen to that statement now. He's not saying the church saw people saved daily, though they did, but he's emphasizing they came to church. They were joining the church on a daily basis. Now, we see people saved all the time at this church. Every single day, we at least have one person saved. I mean, literally, every single day. There hasn't been a day in years that our church, uh, someone from our church hasn't at least seen one person saved, okay? Now, however, however, we don't have people joining our church on that kind of a frequency. Now, if we would have church members that were filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, it's attractive. People will want to come here. They'll want to be a part of our church. That oil of gladness is attractive. All right, number one, gladness comes when people are filled with the Holy Ghost. Number two, look at Jude. Go to the book of Jude. There's only one chapter. It's right before Revelation. Let's look at verses 24 and 25, the last two verses of the, the, the epistle of Jude. Jude Chapter 1, again, there's only one chapter, so you, you can't blink or you'll miss it. Just, just make sure and keep your eyes open, Brother Carlos. I saw you blinking back there. But uh, look at verse 24, Jude. 
Verse 24, it says this, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. All right, number two, write this down. Gladness comes when people get right with God. Write that down. Gladness comes when people get right with God. It says right there, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Now, when you fall, guess what? You're not right with God. Amen. When you fall in sin or fall out of God's will or when you fall away from God as far as reading your Bible, praying, going to church, things like that, but that's a sign that you're not right with God. So God says, I'm going to keep you from falling. I am able to keep you from falling. And therefore, you can be presented faultless before God's presence of the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And again, exceeding joy is synonymous with gladness. So gladness comes when people get right with God. Now, there are four ways that a person can get right with God and uh, or simply get their lives right that, they're, that was wrong. There are four ways. Letter A, write this down. Salvation. Salvation. See, you're headed for hell before you're saved, right? And then when you get saved, you got it right. You're no longer going to hell. Now you're going to heaven. How many times, how many times, how many times, how many times have I led people to the Lord? And as soon as they got saved, oh, my soul, the gladness that, that was beaming on their face. They had a lot of times people have tears. I got to lead a lady to the Lord on Thursday morning at her workstation. And uh, she got saved and she just started crying. She was weeping. She was so overcome with joy and just so happy to be saved because she felt like she never could know that she was going to go to heaven. It was always a daily thing. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I got to confess every day and I got to beg God to let me not go to hell that day. And hopefully if I died that day, I'd get to go to heaven. And when she found out about being saved, boy, was she glad. Are you listening? Salvation produces gladness. Now, do you remember how you felt when you got saved? Oh, my soul. You know how I felt when I got saved? I felt the weight of my sins was lifted off of my shoulders. The weight of my, I mean, I felt so much gladness and joy in my heart when I got saved. And I'm just telling you something, when people get saved, that's, they're getting right with God and they can have gladness. Next, letter B, write this down, confession, confession, especially when you confess to God. When you confess your sins to God, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, with his blood, by the way. And I'm just going to tell you this right now. When you confess your sins with, to God, he cleanses you. You get right with him. And I'm telling you, you feel glad. When you're living in sin, you feel remorse, you feel regret, you feel shame, you, you feel um, uh, down because, you know, you've let the Lord down, you know, and, and, and you don't want to be around people that are right with God. Sometimes people live in sin. They don't want to go to church because they feel so bad, even though we want people to come because church is a spiritual hospital. It's for people who are sinning that want to get right. But, but I'm just telling you, that's the way the devil works and when you're living in sin you do not have gladness in your heart but boy when you confess that sin to the Lord and you get right with him that gladness comes letter C write this down reconciliation <sighs> reconciliation now I'm talking about relationship relationship the okay the prodigal son what did he do when he woke up in the pig's pen and he confessed I did this to myself. And that's when he confessed to God. Now, he didn't confess to his dad yet, but he confessed to God. He says, what am I doing? This is wrong. But if he just stayed there, there would have been no reconciliation. But here's what he said. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go back to my dad. I'm going to tell him I'm sorry for what I did to him and, 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 and the dumb decisions I made and just ask him for a job. If he'd just hire me, my life will be better just to be an employee of my daddy. And yet, of course, the dad, you know, welcomed him home. My son was dead, alive again. But that was reconciliation. The relationship was restored. So you can confess your sins to God. And at that moment... Have gladness in your heart, but gladness will be permanent 
if you get reconciled in your relationship with God. You see, that means you get your relationship restored. And I promise you it helps. And by the way, on an offshoot, when you get reconciled with people, if there's someone in your life that you're at odds with and, and you get reconciled with them, your relationship now will have gladness, right? But it's the same thing with God. If you have wandered away from God, and you get reconciled and restore your relationship with God and get back on the right path. And okay, let's, for example, let's suppose you haven't read your Bible or prayed privately, you know, devotional, private devotions for months and you're living in sin. Well, let's suppose you confess your sin to God. Immediately, you're going to be glad about that. But now if you start reading your Bible and praying again on a daily basis, you're restoring that relationship. Your gladness will just continue to be there because of reconciliation. And then lastly, letter D, write down the word dedication. Dedication. Gladness is going to come when you dedicate your life to God. Now listen to me. Some teenagers and some young adults need to understand this. Your life is not yours to live on your own and for your own. Are you listening? You say, I've got all these dreams. I got all these plans. Well, it may not coincide with God's dreams and God's plans. Why do you think you're here on this planet? You're here because God puts you here. When you dedicate your life to God, man, I'm telling you something, you're going to have gladness in your heart. I remember for a solid year, God was working on me to be a preacher, and I said, no, 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 no. First, I said no because I didn't think I could do it. Didn't think I could publicly speak. Ain't no way, Jose and uh, Maria and whoever your name is. No way. And uh, but uh, and uh, but the fact of the matter is, is you know, I was resisting for many different reasons, and I wanted to pursue a career in sports. And to this day, I still love sports. I never have gotten that bug out of my uh, that virus out of my body yet. And uh, y'all pray for me. But nonetheless, that's where I was headed. And there came a day, and I said, God. Not my will be done, but thine. I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I dedicate my life to you. It was June 14, 1987. June 14, 1987. I walked down the aisle at Hopewell Baptist Church, and I filled out a decision slip, and Pastor Ray read it from the pulpit and said, this teenage boy in our church, young man, actually, uh, I was going to turn 18 the next month, but I was 17 at the time. He said he's come, given his life to God, and God's called him to preach. And again, I, you know, I didn't remember anybody saying amen or clapping or anything. I think everyone was in shock. <laughs> Corey, Sulian, being a preacher? Well, God bless his heart. And I learned many years later that down south when someone says, bless your heart, that's not really a good thing. Um, they're having extreme pity on you. And uh, I didn't get any amens. I probably got some, well, bless his heart. <laughs> you know, that's probably what I got, even though it was in California. Ah, but the fact is, when I dedicated my life to God, I'm telling you, it is the greatest life I could have ever lived. Greatest life. The last 37 years, I'm so happy to be a preacher. I'm so happy to to be in God's will. I'm so happy to have dedicated my life to God. Go back in time, 37 plus years ago, I'd do it all over again. I don't care the difficulties or the devil's attacks or things that haven't maybe turned out like I wanted them to. It is still the most gladness I could possibly have, the most joy, the happiest life I could ever live. I am so glad I have dedicated my life to God. Now listen to me, adults, if you haven't done that yet, you ought to do it now. I mean, seriously, what are you waiting for? We're not getting any younger. You ought to say, God, I, I'm yours. Now, he may not call you to preach, but if you just say, God, my life is yours, I'll do whatever, ever you want me to do. By the way, when you dedicate your life to God, you don't ever have a problem with your pocketbook. Because when you dedicate your life to God, here's what you do. You put your whole body in God's offering plate. Say, I'm completely yours, and part of you is your pocketbook. A lot of times people get fussy about tithing and offerings. They just haven't dedicated their life to God. Because if you dedicate your life to God, you say, God, it don't matter what you want. I'm doing whatever you want. 
And that includes your pocketbook, but it includes everything. Now, listen to me, Bobby, you're going to have so much joy. You'll, have, you'll be so glad. Oh, you'll be so glad. If you just simply say, God, whatever this book tells me to do, whatever you, Holy Spirit, tell me to do, I'm yours. Tell me how to live. Tell me where to, you know, uh, 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 how to live, where to live, what job to have, what church to go to, what ministry to be a part of. It doesn't matter. I'm yours. I dedicate my life to you. And guess what? You're going to have gladness. So gladness comes when people get right with God, specifically salvation, confession, reconciliation, dedication. And that's why when we have long invitations at this church and people are getting saved and people are getting baptized like we've had in the last week listen to me it's so important for you to have gladness in your heart and express it while you're here instead of <laughs> and, <laughs> and <laughs> all of that while people are getting saved and baptized man it ought to thrill your heart listen this carefully there's over 60 churches in this town. At least there was at one point when I, when I moved here. I assume there's still at least 60. Maybe one or two other churches at all in this town will have people genuinely saved and baptized on a regular basis. Maybe. I mean, maybe. I'm not talking about a false gospel. And yeah, people get baptized all the time in churches around here, like to join the church, baby baptisms, you know, things like that. But I'm not including those because those aren't scriptural. I'm telling you, you ought to thank God you're in a church where people are getting saved and baptized on a regular basis, where people are getting dedicated in their lives to the Lord, getting right with God, coming to the altar and weeping for God, you know, to bless them and, and to forgive them and all of that. Man, it's exciting when things like that happen. You know, Brother, uh, Brother David, I'm not sure exactly how it was that time up in uh, the two or three years that you were the intern pastor in, in Canada, if you had baptisms on a regular basis. But if you did, you understand it. It's fun to have people baptized on a regular basis. You know, I tell, I tell Brother David, got someone ready to get baptized. He's not like, oh, man, again? Come on, <laughs> whatever. Didn't I just baptize someone last, last service? Why don't we just have one service a week? We tell all of them, just come get baptized that time, and then the rest of the time you leave me alone. <laughs> no, Brother David doesn't say that. Man, he's happy, man. Woo! It's awesome seeing people get right with God. Salvation, baptism, confession, dedication, reconciliation, all of that. It produces gladness, and we need to make sure we have that attitude when we come to church and things like that happen. Number three, look at Psalms 119. Psalms 119, God is so good, my friend. Oh, my soul, I love living for God. Love living for God. Psalm 119, verse 111. <sighs> Psalm, are y'all glad on the internet up there in internet land? <laughs> Psalm 119, look at verse number 111, please. And uh, Psalm 119, and uh, verse number 111, please. Let's take a look at that. Are you listening now? And uh, let's make sure and really give your heart and mind to, to what I'm saying right now. Don't be distracted. Psalm 119, verse 111, it says this, Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Number three, write this down. Gladness comes when you feast on the word of God. Gladness comes when you feast on the word of God. It literally says there, the psalmist says God's word. It says, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. Listen to this very carefully. If you'll just get in the Bible whenever you're having a tough day, a down day, a discouraging day, the devil's fighting, trials, t testings, whatever come your way, just read the Bible or get that Bible app on your phone and just listen to it being read to you by someone who's narrating the Bible. And I promise you, I promise you, it will be the rejoicing of your heart. Look over at Jeremiah chapter 15. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 15. By the way, I can always tell people who are reading their Bible on their own when I'm preaching, because if I'm preaching the Word of God and they got a smile on their face with what I'm preaching, I can tell they've spent time in the Bible. People that get offended at Bible preaching, I can just tell they haven't spent much time in God's Word. They just haven't. Because when you spend time in God's Word, God's Word will be the rejoicing of your heart, whether you read it for yourself or hear it preached by a preacher. Amen? All right, look at Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Are you there? 
Jeremiah 15. Hey, we've only got four points. This is point number three. If y'all sit up straight and pay attention and, and listen well, we might be getting done here soon. All right, Brother Carlos, we might. Okay, all right. Look at Jeremiah 15, 16. Look what it says. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. This is a testimony of Jeremiah, the prophet. Guess what he said? I found God's word and I ate it up. I ate it up and God's word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. You say, preacher, how can I get just a whole bunch of gladness in my heart? Feast on the word of God. Feast on the word of God. You know, if you would reflect and do some self-examining, the days that you've really struggled with your attitude, depression and anger and all of that, can you look back on it and say, how much time did I spend in the Bible? How much time? You know, I've always told people, I've always told people, you want better rest at night? I, you don't need to raise your hand, but some of you, how many of you struggle with not getting good sleep at night? You know, things like that. I recommend that you just take your phone out Plug it into a wall charger and play it softly all night long while you're sleeping. The Word of God being read to you. Just have the Word of God being read. You know, there's, there really is science to prove this. I mean, a lot of times people go to sleep with waterfalls and raindrops, on, you know, sound. And, uh, you know, playing that uh, nature um, playing that nature noise and stuff and it calms you and it helps you to be able to sleep. It's the same thing with the Word of God. It's the exact same thing. I, I've had people that came to my office for counseling and, um, and they've had uh, struggles with nightmares and uh, they say, preacher, I've got bad dreams and I don't, I don't sleep very well. What, what should I do? And I tell them, Get your Bible app out on your phone and plug it into a wall charger so that it doesn't, you know, lose, you know, uh, battery life. And, um, and then put it on a you know, loop so it just keeps reading it, keeps reading it and doesn't stop. And, you, like, you can start in Matthew chapter 1, I think, through, you know, six or seven hours. You can get, you know, like a third of the way through the New Testament. You can go through the New Testament, if I remember correctly, in like three nights. And, you know, as far as eight hours of sleep a night, you know, 24 hours, I think. If I remember correctly, about 24 hours, you you can read through your uh, New Testament or listen to it being read to you. And, um, and so, but the fact of the matter is, I mean, I'm telling you, it's going to help. Hey, how about being at home doing dishes, doing housework, watching a baby? I don't know. Whatever you do at home, why don't you put the, put the uh, Bible uh, on audio and just listen while you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. Or hey, mechanics, working on cars, right, Brother Isaac? And uh, working on a car, just put that Bible app and let it just be reading the whole time that you're working on a car. I mean, whenever you're doing the regular routine things of life, have that audio Bible just being read, just being read out loud. And then have some time every day where it's just you and God's word, nothing else. You're not, you're not multitasking. You're just you and God's word, nothing else. You're having private devotions. And then, of course, when you come to church, most of you do this, but just listen. Just listen to the preaching of the word of God. It's going to be the joy and rejoicing of your heart, you know? And uh, when you're, you're here, not just in your body, but you're here in your mind and in your heart as well. It's going to make a difference. So when you have that time where you just, just you and God's word by yourself, and then when you're doing other things and you can have the word of God being played audio and on the background, I mean, just so, so well. gladness comes when you feast on the word of God. Not when you just read a scripture here and there or just read the Bible a couple minutes a week, when you feast on the word of God. Number four and last. Go back to Acts chapter 2. Back to our, our beginning passage that we started with. Acts chapter number 2. And let's look down in verses 46 and 47 once again. Acts chapter number 2. This will be the last point. And I'll just say some closing comments. I want our church to grow. And I know that if we are people that are filled with gladness, it'll just be attractive to people that visit. They'll want to come here. You know, that's why, by the way, that's why it's good for you to respond while I'm preaching. 
If I get up here and I'm preaching away and you're saying amen, yes, praise God. Shake that bush. Pull over and park a while. Brother Lee, I hadn't heard you say that in a while. Pull over and park a while. You know? but, but when you're responding to me while I'm preaching with joy and gladness as far as affirmation, then visitors that come here, they're like, man, this is a good place to be. People are excited. They're with it and all this. But when I'm preaching and pouring my heart out and everybody's just Visitors come here and they say this, that guy's the only one that believes what he's saying. Everybody else is just here because they have to be here. I'm not coming. As soon as this service is over, I'm out of here. I ain't coming back because they don't believe it. But when there's joy in the church spirit, in the, added, in the service, the church service, it's attractive. That's why every, every Sunday I want to have a dad's joke. You know, so some of you, you don't understand this. You, just, you know, when I was at Howells Anderson College, there was a method and a reason for everything that Jack Howells did when he was pastoring the church as far as the church services and the way he conducted himself. And I am telling you, I am not just telling Jack dad jokes when I come to church just because I think I'm funny or just because it's something I want to do. It creates joy and gladness, and it helps to create an atmosphere where it's, it's fun and it's attractive. And I'm just telling you, there's, there's a reason for all of it. So, you know, you may think some of my dad jokes are, you know, like that. But that's okay. You'll, it's still worth it because then I just laugh at myself. And then you laugh at me too. But at any rate, um, Acts chapter 2, look at verse 46. And they, now here's what happened. They continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Number four, write this down. Gladness comes when church people continue in the Christian life with unity. It said gladness and singleness of heart. That expression, singleness of heart, that meant they were on the same page, going in the same direction with the same goals. They were unified. So when we have gladness and unity in our Christian walk, in our Christian life, it's, it's, it's going to help our church to grow. Gladness comes when church people continue in the Christian life with unity. It says they continue daily with singleness of heart. And then gladness was present. And as a result, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, listen to me very carefully, and I'm, all, I'm almost done. You know what attracts people to the world? Sin is what, what attracts them to go out there. Like Vegas, you know, Sin City. I, I, I wish every Christian could just simply understand it. How, can you, how, how could you think, I'm going to Sin City, and that's a good thing? You know, I just, you know, well, there's a lot of good other things there. Well, everything that Vegas has, I'm sure you can find in other cities of America, several that are not known for being sin city. But the point is simply this. Now listen carefully. What is attractive about the world when it comes to sin? It's joy and gladness. I'm, I'm not, I don't think you should ever do this, but like if you ever happen to be watching TV and commercials come on and you see these beer commercials, they're always joy and gladness in the commercials. They don't show someone vomiting on themselves lying in the gutter after getting drunk. They don't show, buy Budweiser and then a, a car wreck. So you can get in a car wreck. They don't show that stuff. That stuff is reality. It's what happens. But how do they advertise it? Joy and gladness. Come drink this alcohol, you're gonna have fun. Colorado's a, you know, well, there's so many states now, but. It was one of the first ones. Recreational marijuana. Psh, come on now. Smoke that pot. You're going to have so much fun and joy in your life. All this stuff. What does the devil do? He puts up a facade of joy. Now, the joy's there. But here's what God says. Are you listening? Sin is fun for a season. Once the season ends, it's not fun anymore. It's misery and pain, remorse, regret, heartache, sadness, failed marriages, failed relationships, loss of income, maybe even loss of freedom if you go to jail because of your sin. Now, listen to me carefully. 
a season is typically three months. I'm 54 years of age. If I live another 40 years, that'll be 94. One season out of 40 years, I mean, there's four seasons in a year. There's 160 more seasons I can live if I live 40 more years. What will that sin give me? One season of fun out of 160 seasons. And if I don't get right with God, there's 159 seasons to follow of misery and pain and heartache and remorse and regret and shame and all of that. So yes, the devil says, come smoke dope, come drink alcohol, come commit adultery, come fornicate, come whatever, gamble, come and live in the sins and the pleasures of this world because you're going to have so much fun and joy and gladness. And when you do it, it's there, but it's only there temporarily. And then it's gone forever. Now, look at what God says. You come and live for him and do the things we're talking about, and you'll have joy and gladness that will last forever. That's a lot longer than one season. See, when you get to go to heaven, you're going to have a smile on your face forever. Not just three months of pleasure, forever pleasure. Amen? So listen carefully. That's what our church needs to be. Church full of people with gladness. And when there is gladness among the people when we assemble for church, it's attractive. And the Lord will add to the church daily such as should be saved. Just like he did in the book of Acts. Look, that was the most difficult time to be a Christian in the history of Christianity. That was the most difficult time to grow a church in the history of churches. Why? They had just crucified their Savior and they were hunting everybody down that claimed to be a Christian. They were persecuting them. They were killing some of them. They were throwing some of them in jail. And yet, what did the church have? Gladness. Amen. And that's why it grew. So listen, you don't have to be glad because of circumstances. You can be glad because you're filled with the Holy Ghost. You can be glad because you got right with God. And you can be glad because you're feasting on the Word of God on a regular basis. And then our church collectively can have gladness if we have unity, singleness of heart, continuing daily, going in the same direction, same goals, same attitude. Hip, hip, hooray, we're all here. Let's get together. Let's go charge hell with squirt guns. Let's live for God and lead everyone to Christ that we possibly can. And then that gladness comes. And as that gladness comes and stays, people will be attracted. Because it's genuine. All these people in the world, I guarantee you, they know what it's like to be fooled by the devil in the world. Where they had joy temporarily and then it was gone. I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. I went to go see Pat Cunningham today and I got to have a talk with one of her adult grandchildren. I think he said he's 31 years of age. And he told me how he used to go to church as a teenager and then he went into the world to live his life the way he wanted to live it. And he said, I quickly found out it was not what it was cracked up to be. And now at age 31, I want to, I want to be close to God. Now, he said he hadn't found a good church to go to yet because every church he goes to, there's, there's issues and stuff. And what he was explaining to me, it seemed legit. I just said, man, I wish you lived in Longmont. I said, I think you'd enjoy coming to Hopewell, but he, he lives in Wyoming. But um, at any rate, the fact of the matter is, he told me, he goes, every time we go into the world, he said, we think it's going to be awesome. And we quickly find out it's not. So these people know that. They can spot False joy from a mile away. When there are churches like our charismatic churches around, you know, that people are running up and down the aisles and they're all dancing and doing all of this. And I've seen videos where there's church members and preachers grabbing snakes and going like this with snakes and, you know, drinking poison and, and just being goofy. The world can tell that that's false. That's imitation joy. But when they see real biblical gladness and joy in a congregation, I'm telling you what, it's attractive. So that's what we've always got to be.
Always, every time we get together, always got to be. But especially when visitors come. And by the way, if we have that gladness as a church, as a group of people, God will send people to our church because he knows they're looking. And this is a place they can find real gladness. You remember when you first came, Miss Angela? Angela? You remember when you first came? Man, it was like six years ago, five, six years ago, something like that. You know why you keep coming? Because you know it's real here, don't you? And uh, you found some friendships, and you found the Lord. And, uh, and that's what you were looking for. And that's what everybody, if they'll be honest with you, they're looking for genuine gladness. And they just try to find it in the world, try to find it in the wrong places. But if they come here, and we're full of gladness, they just might stick. And God just might send them here because he knows they'll find what they're looking for. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. We love you, Lord. Lord, thank you.